We're here with Millennium Live at the Transformational CMO Assembly at the Four Seasons Hotel in Denver. I'm lucky enough to be joined by Connie Weaver, the co-founder and CEO of the Tracker Group. Hi, Connie. How are you? Hey. How Thanks you for joining us. Pleasure. So, you co-founded the Tracker Group to really help businesses of all size unleash their potential and navigate through challenges that might slow them down. What services does Tracker Group provide, and in what particular helps guide a business into the path to achieve their best outcomes? Well, my partner and I, and we're very different, but yet we really understand business end to end. I'm a chief marketing officer, she's the CFO. The two of us have lived in all sorts of aspects of the C-suite, including doing invest investor relations together for a number of years. Once you do that, you really start to understand what makes businesses tick, how to help them in good times and bad times. And I must say, I've done my share of transformation over my 35-year career in a variety of industries during a variety of change. And so you want to take, and to me it was about giving back. Yep. Instead of going to work for another big company, the ability to now work as a catalyst with a small company, somebody starting out. So for example, one of the clients we're working with is called Crew Guru. And it's a group of people who recognize that people who work in the creative production industries, photographers, filmmakers, performing arts, events, you know, really live in a gig economy. We talk yep. a lot about the gig economy. That was the original one. And so we're, this group is creating a network to help them find jobs, source jobs, build their businesses, have access to fintech that is very, very specialized for them, and we're going to help that get off the ground. So it's kind of like a very specialized LinkedIn versus hands-on job creation community. That sounds like some fantastic work. And I love it. That's fantastic. So you mentioned your th long and distinguished career. You've moved through different industries, from including publishing and and insurance. What were the most fascinating things you experienced as you found yourself at all these different checkpoints in your work? You know, it's interesting. Many people grow up in one industry or one function. I'm one of those people that have always believed in going in, making an impact, fixing, building, shifting something during good times and bad, but then self-obsoleting. -obs so bringing in the people that are going to come behind you to run the business because I want to go on and do something else. And I've been lucky enough to be able to do that across industries. And I think that started because when you start in publishing, you touch all industries. I mean, mm -hmm. McGraw-Hill was in computers, construction, financial services, technology, education, you name it. You get to taste so many different industries and it prepares you to be kind of brave in forging and learning new customers, new situations at different points of time. And I must say, I've been very fortunate to see industries go through periods of dramatic change and some cases have to completely reinvent themselves. Look at publishing, look at the media today. Um, to be at the very ground floor of Microsoft's history when they launched Windows 95 or to be in telecom that was booming and then all of a sudden went through a pretty dramatic convergence. So if you think about those times, they are tumultuous, they're exciting, they're built, and then culminating with financial services. And if you lived through the period in 08 in insurance or financial services to today where you're really trying to connect with people on a different level, yeah. that's fun. And you made it out. And I made it out, and I've got stories to tell. No doubt. So having directed all facets of brand transformation in your experiences at McGraw-Hill, AT&T, and TIAA, you really know what it takes to, for a brand to stand out. How can a brand in 2018, 2019 find their voice in a space that has so much noise? Well, you know, you have to look at where you are with a brand and being very clear about who you are, what you do, and why you're different, but also always being relevant. There's two sides of branding. There's the science and there's the art. There is the physical and there is the emotional. 
And so many times people get so hung up in the physical, they forget that brands are the way you make people feel. And if you know your customers, and in this day and age, frankly, with all of the wonderful technology and analytics we have, you can know your customers in ways that we never could 20 years ago. You have the ability to ensure that you stay connected, you stay relevant, and most importantly, you engage people so that they become, tr you, are, you build trust, loyalty, and you help them deliver their outcomes. And that's particularly important when you're in financial services. Yeah. So in relation to a brand finding their voice in a crowded space, authenticity remains a looming factor in an organization's development. Why does authenticity matter more than ever in the marketing industry? So I would say regarding authenticity, it starts with trust. If you can find trust and you can find connection, all of that comes together with being authentic. That's where you resonate, you connect, you understand how your brand makes people feel. Yeah. Too many brands are about what they want you to do, but it's really how you make them feel. And if you achieve something, you get them to do something, you get them to buy something, but at the end of the day, they have buyer's remorse, they don't, remorse, they don't feel good, they feel underappreciated, they feel intimidated. We often do that in financial services, even by the words we choose. Um, you're gonna get a different outcome. So being authentic, connecting with people, and understanding the one size in this day and age never fits all, and that it is about connections, not just connections for one, but connections across generations and across different groupings. So true. Uh, so how can switching topics to marketing leadership, another specialty area for you, although difficult, it is not impossible for a CMO to become a CEO. It's starting to you know, happen more frequently. How do you think industries can break free from the traditional thinking to convince boards that a CMO is qualified to be the CEO? Well, first of all, I've just joined another public company board, and I have worked with CEOs throughout my entire career. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you start with is, as a marketer, you bring something very critical to the table, the voice of the customer, the experience of the customer, and the strategy. So you've got to enter that room with confidence that what you have is important and it's a key part of the dialogue and strategy. So start there, because too many people start being intimidated from day one. Number two, if you really think about where things are transcending today, where things are going to, in the past, CEOs predominantly came out of finance. As a matter of fact, I was sitting there counting how many CEOs I've either worked for or worked closely with within a C-suite. There are about nine of them. And out of the nine, six of them came out of finance. But more recently, they've been coming out of the technology sphere, the engineering sphere. Of course, when you work for Bill Gates, I mean, he's kind of one of a kind. <laughs> but um, you know, in, in all honesty, in many cases as a marketer, you're in there educating. You're, you're fighting your way through to ensure that people understand the customer, the customers at the table, and the customers, and you, what you do is not viewed as an expense. But it really is about being at the table, being relevant in this day and age, and many of the skills and qualities in times of digital transformation, multi-channel complexity, uh, where you're really thinking about all the behaviors that drive revenue, it's about driving revenue, driving outcomes, being successful. And by the way, at the end of the day, for most companies, last time I checked, that's how you build share owner value. And that's what boards, share owners, and CEOs think about all the time. Do you also think that, you know, as the CMO is often, you know, the spokesperson, the person driving, you know, the content, the messaging, that, that, you know, in this day and age, that, that also helps them, you know, then if they're the CEO, you know, they're, they're kind of already the spokesperson. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Nick, because, you know, you, it's all about connecting and resonating with people. And that takes leadership, and it also entails storytelling. It's knowing who you are, what you do, why you're different, and how do you communicate that so it connects with multiple and often 
conflicting audiences. So it is a level of storytelling, a level of engagement that um, is much more deliberate than a lot of people think about. And at the end of the day, that's how people lead. That's the voice they have. And many CMOs really do understand complex and again, often conflicting voices and channels. When you think about managing the press on one hand, managing customers on another, and understanding kind of the voice of the employee and how to really engage employees, those are complex audiences. Yep. And other than the CEO, I don't think there's anybody else except the CMO that really gets it yeah. in a meaningful way. So how can, whether it's a CMO or CEO or you know, any marketing executive, recruit a team of visionary, trailblazing executives to really deliver the world-class solutions to their consumers? And where does it begin? Well, you know, I've, one of the things when I look back over my 35 years that I am most proud of, it's the people that I've met, worked with, and cultivated along the way. There's nothing more satisfying, I call them my kids, than finding this diamond in the rough or someone who's super smart but needs to be grown and bringing them along. And before you know it, they're doing things they never thought they could do. I always have a saying, and that is, get on the bus, follow me, and I guarantee you, six months, a year from now, you're gonna look back and you're gonna be blown away by the things you're doing that you never thought you could do because a lot of people overthink it. And so I always look for diverse talent. I don't always go for the cookie cutter. Some of it's instinct, but finding people who have the skills, the potential, and the drive to really explore and go be well beyond the boundaries. That's a great met method, and clearly it's, it's worked. worked well. <laughs> so there's numerous trends impacting the marketing industry almost daily that are disrupting the traditional roles and values. What trends are you keeping your eye on most as we head into the new year of you know, digital transformation? Well, you know, it's interesting because we're in such a digital environment where everyone's being bombarded, personalization is at its key. We have never, when I look back over, the, over time, we've never had more information. We almost have too much information, I would argue. So it's how you really organize it and use your skills, your tools, your analytics to mine what you need. And I think, you know, often we forget about the fact that we often get excited about the newer companies that are starting with new systems, new capabilities. But many businesses are built on old bones, as I call them, old systems, legacy pools of information that you gotta figure out, mine, and bring forward. And so it's really, you know, depending on what your situation is, and whether you're B2B or whether you're direct to consumer, wherever you are, it's finding and understanding where you sit, what you know about those customers, and what are the most innovative and new ways to begin to resonate with them. And it goes back to what you said earlier, and it's how do you really drive relevance, trust, yeah. and engagement. And then it's you know, also how, at the same time getting the, the next customers. Getting the next customers, keeping your customers. Yeah. I mean, there are many industries that can bring them in the door, but they can't keep them. Yeah. That's you know, retention is just as important. It's a great point. So we're so thrilled that, to have you join us here at the Transformational CMO Assembly in Denver this week. What leading up to the assembly were you looking forward to most? And you know, here today, have you, you know, got the most value out of? Well, this is my second assembly, and as you know, I asked to come back. Why? Because coming here, you give, but you also receive. And I find it just incredibly refreshing to learn about new technologies, listen to the people that are your partners coming in, yep. and sharing their ideas, sharing best practices, and at the same time, giving back. The ability to sit in a room with CMOs at different phases of their career and share some of the things that 
they don't always get to share with people is really, really refreshing. And knowing that no matter where you are along the way, everybody generally is facing a lot of the same challenges. And so it's great to have that sharing. I love the way this organization creates those connections, and it makes it a treat for me. Well, we're, we're for, it's a treat for us to have you with us. Well, thank you. Um, just a couple of last questions. What do you think are the biggest benefits for a CMO or a, any C-level executive in attending you know, a small intimate assembly such as, such as ours? So attending an assembly like this that's more intimate, smaller, means that you can make connections and have conversations. Yeah. When you're at large conferences and people, you know, you're running from place to place and you, session to session, you never get to see the same person twice. Yeah. You don't build relationships. This is an opportunity to build relationships and, and I love the blend of hearing from thought leaders but also getting in the room, rolling up your sleeves, and talking about those conversations, like how do you manage in an environment that's shifting from product to customer? Or how do you deal with silos? Those are the things that everybody's got a story around, and sharing stories is also building relationships and making it really, really work. So to me, two days of really creating relationships, really sharing, and learning at the same time, and, at the, and meeting new people, looking at new ways of thinking and doing. For me, even though I'm not a CMO of a Fortune 100 company anymore, I'm helping other companies come along. I'm learning every day, and this is a great place to do that. Fantastic, and I can't let you go without asking you, as we're now in the you know, middle of October of 2018, looking ahead to 2019, what is your single biggest tip for a CMO for next year? That's an interesting question because I could think of a lot of tips, but I think the most important one, and this depends on where a CMO is in their career, right. but for someone starting out, I'd say don't over plan it, don't rush it, just learn and never take your eyes off the customer trying new things. For someone mid-career, and I, used, I said this when I gave the um, graduation speech at the University of Maryland, my alma mater, last winter. I said, too many people put guardrails up and they're afraid to take a risk. You know, you gotta go out and make some mistakes sometime or you'll yeah. never, ever really learn. And for CMOs further along in their career, make sure you don't become so internally focused, so focused on your job that you stop learning, stop experimenting, stop developing relationships, going to wonderful events like this outside because you will regret it when you look back. That's a fantastic tip. Uh, my tip. <laughs> thank you so much. Connie Weaver, thank you for joining us here. The Transformational CMO Assembly and for joining us with Millennium Life.